Good morning. Welcome to today's national webinar, Emerging New Therapies for Tuberculosis, sponsored by the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center. I am Karen Simpson, the Director of Education and Training at SNTC. Before we start today's event, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Today's event is scheduled for two hours, including the question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you've joined us for webinars and grand rounds in the past, you'll notice that our web conferencing service has changed. We hope you enjoy the new features available, and we welcome your feedback, which you can provide to us on today's evaluation. Speaking of evaluation, to verify your participation in this event, please provide your email in the CE box, the pod, on the screen within Adobe Connect. We will send you an email with a link to the online evaluation following today's presentation. Please be aware that you must complete the online evaluation by 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Monday, that's December 17th if you want to receive physician and nursing credit. You may submit questions for the speaker at any time during the presentation by typing your question in the Q&A box. Questions will be addressed after the presentation concludes. You may also download a copy of today's presentation from the presentation slides pod. Select the file you want to download and click the Download Files button. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available to view from SNTC's website. We regret that we are no longer able to provide CE for our archived webinars. As you can see, we are currently providing several video feeds during introductions. However, we will turn these off during the presentation in order to reduce the amount of bandwidth. Thank you for joining SNTC today. And now I'll turn it over to our director of the SNTC and today's moderator, Dr. Michael Lazardo. Good morning, and thank you all very much for being here today. It is my uh, distinct pleasure to uh, welcome you to the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center's annual Arthur Pachenik National Webinar. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Dr. Pachenik, Dr. Pachenik is a legend of sorts in TB control here in the state of Florida with all of his contributions uh, over the years. Dr. Pachenik has recently retired from the University of Miami's Division of Pulmonary Medicine, and during his time he published over 100 articles and uh, was actually published one of the first articles that began to identify the link between HIV and tuberculosis. Uh, for this reason, it is our distinct pleasure and honor to name our annual national webinar the Arthur Pachenik Annual Lecture uh, for Tuberculosis. And speaking of distinct honors, it's also my distinct honor to uh, welcome our uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Neil Schluger. Uh, Dr. Neil Schluger is the uh, Chief of the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine at Columbia University uh, Medical Center in New York. Also, uh, Dr. Schluger's entire career has been basically dedicated to uh, mycobacterial diseases and tuberculosis specifically, and he currently serves as the uh, chairman of the steering committee of the TB Trials Consortium funded by the CDC. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Neil Schluger, who's going to speak, be speaking to us on a very exciting and encouraging topic for us in TB. We've been working for many years waiting for this, um, talking about emerging new therapies for tuberculosis. So I'll turn it over, and again, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, and I'm happy to be with you uh, all, wherever you are this morning. Um, I also want to say it's a particular uh, honor to give the Arthur Pachenik Lecture. I have read and learned a great deal from Dr. Pachenik's work over the years, uh, uh, particularly as uh, Mike mentioned, the um, early work on the link between HIV and tuberculosis, and, and so it's a special thrill for me um, to be able to give that, to give this talk today. Um, oh, hold on one second. Now, I'm looking for my slides. Hi, hi, Dr. Schluger. Are you seeing your slides? No. Okay. Um, what are you seeing on your screen? Just the title 
emerging new therapies for TB. Okay, just one moment, please. Karen, are you guys able to advance your slides? There we go. Okay. So what, uh, what I'd like to talk about today with you um, for the next hour or so uh, is this subject uh, of new drugs for tuberculosis, the need, the hope, and the reality. Uh, and uh, I will say that for the 20 years, in the 20 years or so that I've been involved in tuberculosis research, this probably um, is the most exciting time uh, in that, uh, in the two decades because we actually have something to talk about. There are new drugs to talk about, and um, that's what I want to discuss with you today. I always like to begin my talks with a little bit of epidemiology to place this discussion in context. Um, and so very briefly, I want to review what I think will be familiar to most of you, um, just a, a few uh, aspects of current global tuberculosis epidemiology. So uh, the slide you see now um, shows uh, data from the latest WHO Global Tuberculosis Report, um, and uh, I think most of you are familiar with this, the overall burden of tuberculosis around the world, somewhere in the range of 8 to 9 million cases per year. Um, uh, I think WHO has indicated um, their best estimate last year was 8.4 million cases. Um, 2 million deaths, I, I think the new number is supposed to be about 1.4 million deaths, so I'm not sure how accurate one can really be about those assumptions. Um, but at any rate, tuberculosis remains an incredibly important cause of morbidity and mortality around the world. Um, it's the eighth leading cause of death in the world and has been in the top ten for many, many years. And uh, since TB was identified as a global public health emergency way back in 1993, um, uh, I think it's fair to say uh, it, it has not lost that status. It still remains an enormous public health problem and uh, a global public health emergency. The distribution of TB cases around the world has this familiar west to east and north to south gradient of increasing incidence. Um, so uh, you see, um, for example, uh, very high rates of TB in sub-Saharan Africa um, and then uh, also extremely high rates of TB in Asia, East Asia, South Asia, Central Asia and then uh, moving into uh, Eastern Europe, Russia, and the former Soviet Union. So um, the range of incidents, um, the low end, the United States, where the rate of the incidence of TB is on the order of about 3.2 per 100,000 persons um, to uh, countries in Eastern Europe uh, and Asia where the range might be from uh, 100 to 300 or so per 100,000, and then countries in Southern Africa which have rates um, exceeding 500 per 100,000 and occasionally approaching 1,000 per 100,000. So that's um, what the burden is and where it is. Um, and then, of course, there are two particular features of TB epidemiology um, that need special attention. The first, of course, is the co-epidemic uh, of HIV infection. And HIV, certainly uh, in southern Africa, um, is driving the TB epidemic. So many countries in southern Africa where more than half of all patients with tuberculosis um, have HIV infection. Not so true in, in other high burden countries like India, China, um, and, and some nearby countries. But certainly in southern Africa, the HIV epidemic is, is uh, really driving a lot of uh, tuberculosis. And, and as I'll mention again in a moment or two, this presents particular challenges for the treatment of TB in those regions. Um, and then, of course, uh, something that I think really has gotten all of our attention uh, in the last several years, which is the emergence of multi-drug resistant TB, by which we mean tuberculosis resistant to at least isoniazid and rifampin, the emergence of MDR-TB all over the world, um, uh, although particularly, um, again, in Russia and the former Soviet Union. Um, this big country here is uh, Kazakhstan. Um, where uh, rates of MDR-TB are very, very high um, 
10 to 40 percent of, of new cases of TB are, are multidrug resistant, um, and in some places as many as three quarters of retreatment cases um, demonstrate multidrug resistance. Um, in Africa, you see um, many of the countries have lighter colored yellow uh, fill-in for a lower rate of MDR-TB, but a great deal of Africa is white. That doesn't mean there's no MDR-TB. It just means we don't really have a good idea because many of those countries don't have the resources to routinely test their isolates for drug resistance, both to first and second line agents. So um, I think the estimate, the current WHO estimate of 500,000 cases of MDR-TB around the world, um, if anything, could be a somewhat low estimate. But this is an enormous emerging public health problem uh, uh, that we'll have to deal with in the coming years. So I just wanted to give that little bit of context for the discussion today. Um, and again, just to summarize, there's still a tremendous amount of TB in the world, um, and the co-epidemic of HIV poses uh, enormous treatment challenges, and then, of course, the emergence of MDR-TB. TB poses enormous challenges. And I think that gives you some idea of, in fact, why we need new drugs to treat TB. Um, first of all, even for drug susceptible TB, um, those of us who have worked in, in TB control, um, I think appreciate that uh, regimens that would have a shorter overall treatment duration would be of great benefit. Um, this would make the uh, delivery of uh, tuberculosis treatment much simpler on a public health scale and be uh, perhaps uh, cheaper and certainly easier for our patients. Um, we would like regimens with lower relapse rates. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this in a moment. Um, the current standard regimen in general has a low relapse rate, but not in every circumstance. Um, certainly we like regimens with fewer adverse effects, um, particularly less hepatotoxicity. Um, and then uh, we would like regimens that can be given easily and safely in combination with antiretroviral therapy. I think everyone is now aware that for patients with HIV and TB co-infection, um, there's an enormous imperative to treat both of those essentially simultaneously. It's life-saving to begin antiretroviral therapy very soon after TB treatment has begun, but it's not easy to do that. Um, because of the, the large number of drugs that are required, potentially seven new drugs, four TB drugs, three antiretroviral drugs um, that have lots and lots of side effects, which may not just be additive but may be synergistic, and then um, the uh, risk of inflammatory response uh, uh, syndrome, iris, system, uh, iris syndrome, immune reconstitution, inflammatory syndrome that complicates that therapy as well. So we'd love to have TB regimens that are easier to use with HIV treatment um, because of the imperative, as I said, to, to treat both of those infections simultaneously. And then, of course, uh, we need desperately regimens um, that can effectively and safely treat patients with multidrug resistant and, and extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. Um, so I think these are just some of the reasons we really need new drugs to treat TB. Now, just a review of the current approach to treating TB, and, and I'm going to focus most of this talk on the treatment of active TB. I will, in a moment, say something about uh, latent tuberculosis, but I'm going to focus most of this on active TB. Um, so this, of course, is the current regimen for active tuberculosis, two months induction phase of INH, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol, followed by a continuation phase of four months of isoniazid and rifampin. And there are lots of good things about this regimen. Um, if one has drug-susceptible TB, it's essentially 100% uh, effective in um, achieving uh, culture conversion and sterilization if the patient, um, in fact, takes the medicine. Um, overall, uh, we think this regimen has a low relapse rate on the order of 3 to 4%. Um, it's in, this is now an inexpensive regimen, um, and for that reason, it really can be used all over the world. When rifampin was originally introduced, it, it was quite expensive um, uh, in some areas, um, but that really is no longer the case. And so this regimen um, really can be used uh, and is used all over the world, almost uh, uh, regardless of the economic situation in any particular country. There still are a few countries where the first-line regimen recommended by the National TB Program is, is the same induction regimen, but then six months of isoniazid and ethambutol. It's clearly a less effective regimen. Um, 
um, but still um, uh, being used by a few NTPs. Um, but essentially, this is an inexpensive and universally available regimen, and it can, in certain circumstances, be used intermittently. So a lot of good things about our standard regimen for TB. On the other hand, there are disadvantages. It's six months long, um, and it's hard to uh, achieve uh, high rates of adherence and compliance uh, often with this regimen for that period of time. Um, in certain groups of patients, the relapse rate with the standard six-month regimen is quite high. Actually, patients who fail to convert their sputum culture after two months, patients with extensive bilateral cavitary TB who have already lost um, quite a bit of weight. Um, in patients like that, uh, the six-month regimen has been associated with relapse rates as high as about 15%, um, and therapy should generally be extended um, uh, in those subgroups. So certain groups, uh, the six-month regimen is, is not as effective as we would like. Um, as everyone knows, adverse effects are common with this regimen, and it takes um, really um, diligent, experienced uh, nurses, I think, often to, to coach patients through this. Um, it can generally be handled, but um, it's still not easy. Um, and then uh, we've already alluded to the fact that this regimen uh, interacts with HIV treatment in a whole variety of ways um, that make uh, treatment of both of those difficult. And then, of course, by definition, the regimen is not useful against MDR or XDR strains of TB. So I think there's a clear need for a uh, new regimen. Now, the current drugs we have were developed uh, uh, or initially identified in a, about a 25-year period beginning in the mid-1940s when streptomycin and PAS were identified. Um, streptomycin obviously having a much greater impact than PAS, but from 1944 through 1968, really all of the drugs that we have uh, in our standard armamentarium now were identified in, in that period of time. And you can see it wasn't really uh, that many. Um, these are all the drugs that you know uh, and use. Um, and all identified uh, in this period that ended in 1968, um, more than 40 years ago, their use and the evolution of current regimens to treat TB um, was really defined um, in a period that began in the early 1950s and continued till about the mid-1980s. So in 1952, treatment for tuberculosis was essentially a 24-month regimen of isoniazid and streptomycin. Um, and uh, by 1986, our, our current regimen uh, had been identified um, in a uh, including a landmark study by, um, sponsored by the CDC and the U.S. Public Health Service, so-called Study 21, um, which demonstrated the efficacy of the current six-month regimen. So that took, um, as you can see, uh, 34 years to accomplish, to go, to take that timeline of drugs that I showed you on the prior slide um, and figure out the best possible and shortest possible regimen using them um, took some 30-odd years. A great deal of the work was done by the British Medical Research Council in its TB research units. Um, and over, by my count, 250 regimens were tested in 25,000 patients, at least, um, in order to determine the optimal drug combinations, doses, dosing intervals, and treatment duration. Um, this is a very sobering thought, I think. Um, now we have some drug candidates that would be uh, very discouraging to think that it's going to take 35 years from now to figure out how to improve on current TB treatment using the new drugs that are in the pipeline. But uh, as I said, it is, uh, uh, it's a sobering, sobering thought and history worth remembering as we think about how um, we're going to test new TB drugs and regimens in the coming years. Now, the good news is that there are things test and there is um, a pipeline of drugs to test. Um, Ten years ago, when I talked about emerging therapies for TB, there was literally nothing to say. Um, there were no drugs in the clinical pipeline and very few things in the preclinical pipeline. Sorry. Um, this is just an example of some of what's going on. The Global Alliance for Tuberculosis Drug Development, um, uh, funded substantially by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, has really been a leader um, in uh, drug development for TB along with um, a few other groups and, and fortunately a few pharmaceutical companies. Um, but uh, without spending 
too much time or going over this slide in too much detail, you can see that there are now fairly robust efforts going on in new drug discovery. Um, some of you may have seen yesterday in the New York Times an op-ed piece by Carl Nathan at Cornell talking about um, some approaches to high-throughput screening for new TB compounds. Um, but at least now I think we can say um, that there's something approaching uh, a real pipeline for TB drugs along the lines of what we're used to with other antibiotics and other drugs in general. Um, and as I said, the, the alliance is certainly um, playing a, a significant role here. And what that has led to is um, this list of drugs that are currently in clinical phases of development. Uh, and as far as I know, this list is uh, comprehensive. It's not very long. Um, but I think all of the drugs that have entered at least phase one um, are, are shown um, on this slide. And this is what we'll be discussing um, for the rest of the talk. Um, it's not an extensively long list, and people who are familiar with drug development um, will know that of drugs that enter phase one, um, just under 10% of them will ever really become drugs. That is to say, will be registered, approved by the FDA. Um, so uh, these are the drugs we have, um, and uh, we can be hopeful um, that even just a few of them will make it um, to clinical use. Um, and so we'll talk about them, and I'm going to talk about them um, basically in two groups. Um, I'll talk first about drugs that are already approved for use in the United States um, uh, but haven't really been uh, fully evaluated for the treatment of TB in every possible way, and, and those are rifapentine, moxifloxacin, and gadifloxacin. And then uh, later on, I'll talk about um, drugs that uh, have not yet been approved um, but are very promising for the treatment of TB. So that's how we'll do it. And I'm going to start okay. off um, by talking about several studies that have been sponsored by the Tuberculosis Trials Consortium. Um, Mike mentioned uh, uh, it's been my privilege for about the past dozen years to be the steering committee chairman for this consortium, which is funded by CDC and I think uh, represents CDC's historic commitment to being a leader in TB research um, in the United States and around the world. Uh, our consortium is an international one. We have uh, sites in the U.S., uh, including a, a site here in New York that uh, I direct in very close working relationship with the New York City Department of Health TB Control Program. Um, so we have a number of domestic sites and a number of international sites which are shown on this uh, map. Now, um, I said I wasn't going to spend much time talking about latent tuberculosis, but uh, I do want to mention one study. I think most of you are familiar with this by now, um, but uh, I'd like to begin our discussion um, uh, talking about latent TB and focusing um, on rifapentine for a moment which is a rifamycin uh, of great interest for the treatment of latent and active tuberculosis uh, uh, as a potential uh, treatment shortening agent. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the study. I think people have seen it by now, but this is our study 26 we call Prevent TB, um, a study of uh, the treatment of latent tuberculosis infection where we randomized um, high-risk patients mostly close contacts of active cases, to receive standard therapy, nine months of isoniazid um, self-administered, so that's 270 doses of medication, or um, to receive three months of once a week isoniazid and once a week rifapentine in this trial given of reactivation tuberculosis in high-risk patients with latent infection. And um, we, uh, so, so just first a, a word about rifapentine, why we were interested in it. Rifapentine is a rifamycin. It has exactly the same mechanism of action uh, as uh, the other rifamycins, rifampin and rifabutin. That is to say, it um, prevents RNA polymerization by binding to a gene called RPOB. Um, uh, and uh, inhibits down the line protein synthesis. That's how rifamycins work. Rifapentine works in that way. But rifapentine's uh, chemical personality is such that it has a very long serum half-life. Um, and so there's reason to think that um, a weekly dose, if it's high enough, will give long enough serum levels 
uh, high enough serum levels for a long enough period of time to allow highly intermittent dosing, particularly in a situation like latent tuberculosis infection where the overall bacterial load in the body is low. Um, so with that study design, um, we did this trial. It took us 10 years, but we were gratified that um, the result was as good as it was. Um, it was published uh, just about a year ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, and um, you can see here that um, in patients, uh, in the LTBI patients who received standard therapy, isoniazid alone, in the follow-up phase there were 15 cases of active TB, and then in the patients uh, randomized to the 12-dose arm with isoniazid 900 a week, rifapentin 900 milligrams a week, only seven cases of uh, active TB. This was designed as a non-inferiority trial, and we were able to say with a very high degree of statistical confidence that this 12-dose regimen is non-inferior to the standard 270-dose regimen. Um, uh, and so that was a gratifying result that I think will have um, significant public health uh, impact and, and potential to really dramatically simplify the treatment of latent tuberculosis infection. Now let's talk a little bit about um, rifapentine in uh, Oh, and I'm sorry, I, I realize I have uh, put my slides a little bit out of order. Um, sorry, no, no. I don't know how this looks to people there. It looks, the slide looks like it got a little messed up in the translation. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit, I'm sorry, and, and uh, talk about first quinolones in the treatment of active TB. So that's all I'm going to say about latent tuberculosis. We'll talk the rest of the time about active tuberculosis. Um, and um, uh, as I mentioned, I'll focus first on drugs that are out there um, and may be, interested, it may be interesting to us. And, and so the first group of those are the quinolones. Um, I think everyone is familiar with the idea that quinolones in vitro have quite a bit of activity against mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and the two um, that have the highest degree of activity of the ones we use commonly are levofloxacin and moxifloxacin. Um, there's another quinolone, gadifloxacin, um, which has quite a bit of activity, and I'll mention it uh, a little bit later, although its uh, side, effect, side effect profile, mostly dysglycemia, um, really, I think, has killed it as a drug. But we can still learn something useful about the treatment of TB from it. Um, these data, uh, and I, it's not projecting well to me. I apologize for that. I'm not sure why. Um, but these data are from an animal model of tuberculosis that's uh, uh, used by a very great group at Johns Hopkins, led by Jacques Rosset and Eric Nuremberger and colleagues, to look at experimental regimens. And in this experiment, uh, mice are infected with tuberculosis, um, uh, treated with either nothing or various antibiotic regimens for periods of time, then sacrificed, and then the number of colony-forming units of, of mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, in the lungs are counted. And so what you can see here is, um, and I think you can make this out even um, if the slide's not so clear, um, the straight line going across are the number of bacteria in the lungs of mice who receive no antibiotics. Mice who received the standard regimen of rifampin, isoniazid, and pyrazinamide after two months uh, have uh, a significant drop in the number of bacilli in their lungs. If moxifloxacin um, is added to standard therapy, there's a slight increase in bacterial killing after the first two months. If moxifloxacin is substituted for isoniazid um, in that regimen for the first two months, there's an even greater effect on bacterial killing. Um, so we took note of this um, and uh, decided to design a series of trials that would examine these regimens in, in patients with drug-susceptible TB. And so um, we've published a series of phase two studies um, in patients with drug-susceptible tuberculosis to look at the potential role of quinolones. Uh, in these regimens. So we've used a uh, standard study design in several of our trials that's shown on this slide um, to test the hypothesis that addition or substitution of 
drug X, whether that's a quinolone or something else, um, during the intensive phase of therapy will result in a significantly greater proportion of patients who convert sputum cultures to negative in the first two months compared with the standard regimen. So we take patients with smear-positive tuberculosis, um, and we randomize them to the standard regimen or a novel regimen, as I said, in which a new drug is added or substituted for one of the uh, standard drugs. We treat patients for eight weeks. We collect the sputum culture, and we uh, see which regimen uh, was uh, which regimen achieved greater percentage of of culture sterilization in that two month time. So this is a phase two study. It's not looking at um, a definitive outcome like treatment failure or relapse, um, but it's looking at an intermediate endpoint uh, to uh, in the hopes that we'll be able to pick regimens to move forward into larger studies. After the eight weeks, um, patients are then all treated with standard continuation phase therapy for more months of isoniazid and rifampin. Um, and so we've done a number of these trials, and I'll show you the first two here. These have been published in the last several years. So our study 27 um, examined a regimen um, in which moxifloxacin M was added to standard therapy. Um, essentially, we substituted for ethambutol, but um, I think, as everyone knows, in drug-susceptible TB, ethambutol really um, doesn't do anything in the induction phase. Um, so essentially what we did here is add moxifloxacin to the standard regimen. Um, and uh, to us, uh, disappointingly, there really was no significant benefit of doing that. At the end of eight weeks, um, the same number of patients had converted their sputum cultures to negative in the, in the arm uh, in which moxifloxacin was added to standard therapy as in the standard arm. We then went back and did the second experiment that was suggested by that animal data that I showed you, data that suggested that um, perhaps there's some sort of drug interaction between moxifloxacin and isoniazid that inhibits the activity of moxy. Um, so we did another experiment in which we dropped isoniazid from induction therapy and, and uh, replaced it with moxifloxacin. So the experimental regimen here is moxy, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol compared to standard therapy. And here we saw a small advantage um, to the arm that contained moxifloxacin, um, a 5.5% difference in culture conversion between the two groups, although this did not reach statistical significance. So it was a, a trend in the right direction, but it didn't reach statistical significance. Um, these were fairly large phase two studies. You can see um, 336 or 433 patients done at uh, all the sites in our consortium. Um, I should point out that uh, Marcus Condi, Dick Chasen, and colleagues um, did a smaller study at a single site in Brazil, you can see about 146 patients, um, uh, where they also substituted moxifloxacin for ethambutol, um, essentially adding moxy to standard therapy. And they found a somewhat more positive result. This is uh, the proportion of patients with negative cultures over time. Um, uh, uh, in the first two months of therapy, and at the end of two months, the patients who received moxifloxacin um, in this study, a smaller study, did have a uh, statistically significant improvement um, in culture conversion rates. It was 92% uh, in the moxie-containing arm, 73% in the standard therapy arm for a difference of 18.4. So a more dramatic result than we saw in our study. Again, this was a single-site study and a smaller study. Um, uh, uh, it went in the same direction as our study, but um, achieved a somewhat more dramatic result. My feeling on the basis of the studies we've done in this one is moxifloxacin is certainly a very good tuberculosis drug. Um, it's well tolerated in general, and um, uh, certainly well tolerated in compared to standard therapy or isoniazid. Um, one would say that uh, substituting moxy for isoniazid um, certainly provides no disadvantage. There may be an advantage. Um, uh, to doing that, so it's at least as good a drug as isoniazid, I believe. Um, it doesn't seem to be quite as good a drug as rifampin. Um, so the question really arises, can moxifloxacin alone 
be the cornerstone of a treatment shortening regimen? Is it a potent enough drug to make you think that a, that a moxifloxacin containing regimen um, in and of itself could be shorter? Um, before we even think of that, though, uh, it's worth pointing out that although quinolones are not part of standard therapy for TB anywhere in the world, um, there has already been the emergence of quinolone-resistant tuberculosis in many parts of the world. And this is undoubtedly because quinolones and other antibiotics can be purchased uh, over the counter in many countries in the world, and some patients who have tuberculosis under the mistaken belief probably that they have simple bacterial pneumonia are being treated either by themselves or by their physicians with moxifloxacin or other quinolones, um, and that's generating resistance in TB. And this is just one study um, from India um, that shows that um, in new cases of TB in this one region, Gujarat in India, of new cases of TB, 19% in this study, um, granted it's not a huge one, but 19% were already resistant to ofloxacin. 25% um, of previously treated cases already resistant to quinolones. Um, so although quinolones are quite promising um, for the treatment of TB, I think we'll have to guard uh, very carefully against emerging quinolone resistance because of essentially um, unsupervised and unlimited use of quinolones for a whole host of infections. Now, as I said, um, my own personal view is that the quinolones uh, are at least as potent as isoniazid, maybe not as potent as rifamycins. Um, the question still exists, could they be the cornerstone of treatment shortening regimens? And there are two studies um, that are now fully enrolled that address this problem, and we eagerly await results from them. Um, so the, the one, uh, people may have heard of these studies, the REMOX trial, this is a three-arm trial sponsored by the uh, British Medical Research Council and the TB Alliance, um, and this is a MOXIE-based treatment shortening study. The three arms are a standard therapy arm, two months of isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ephambutol, followed by the standard four-month continuation arm of isoniazid and rifampin. Another six-month arm um, in which moxifloxacin is substituted for isoniazid, um, but otherwise, uh, the regimen is, is the same as our standard six-month arm. And then a four-month arm um, in which the induction phase consists of two months of moxi, isoniazid, rifampin, and, and pyrazinamide, followed by a two-month continuation arm of moxifloxacin, isoniazid, and rifampin. So uh, that's obviously the arm of most interest, a four-month arm. Um, and the outcome in this study is treatment failure and relapse. Enrollment was completed in this trial, although the trial didn't enroll its intended uh, uh, population. I think the trial originally was designed to enroll something like 2,500 patients, and I believe ultimately it enrolled about 1,700 patients. Um, but enrollment was stopped in February of this year, um, and uh, I think fourth quarter 2013 is when results may be expected from this trial. Um, so within a year or so, we may have data from this trial um, uh, and some data about the efficacy of a four-month uh, treatment for drug-susceptible tuberculosis. There's another trial um, that's had perhaps a little more difficult history. Remox itself was quite difficult. Um, a trial called Oflotub, um, sponsored by WHO. Uh, largely, this was a two-arm, ultimately a two-arm trial um, using gadifloxacin. Now, as I mentioned before, gadifloxacin has a lot of activity against TB in, in vitro. Um, it's really not clinically going to be useful as a drug because of side effects, but in the context of this trial, I think we could learn a lot about um, how useful quinolones will be in, in treatment shortening. Um, so here in this trial, um, there's, again, a standard therapy arm, and then, again, a four-month uh, treatment arm quite similar to Remox. Um, where uh, gadifloxacin is essentially added um, to, to the standard regimen, but the regimen is truncated to four months overall. Um, enrollment is complete in this trial, unclear um, when results uh, will be available. Um, but we will have, as I said, uh, data in about a year or so from treatment shortening trials using quinolones as the, as, as the real uh, driver of the treatment shortening. Okay, 
Uh, now to talk about the other drug that is uh, sort of already out there, um, uh, rifapentine is licensed for use in the United States, although it's not used hardly at all. Um, we hope it'll be used more a lot, a lot more now for uh, latent TB, but what about its use in active TB? And again, um, back to the mouse model um, from Eric Nuremberger uh, and colleagues, and this shows you similar experiment. Mice are infected with TB and then treated with a variety of regimens, um, and uh, this shows you what happens to colony counts in the lung of mice treated with essentially standard therapy. Um, this is a regimen in which, uh, again, moxifloxacin is substituted for isoniazid. Um, and then uh, this regimen, these regimens are regimens in which um, rifapentine is used instead of rifampin. And again, remember, um, it works the same way, but it's its pharmacokinetics are such that you get very high levels for a very long period of time, so you get much more exposure um, to rifamycin drug in the system um, than you would with rifampin. And again, in this animal model, it really looked like rifapentine um, achieved much better and faster sterilization um, than did standard therapy. Um, so we have gone ahead and looked at rifapentine in uh, two phase two trials. Um, the first one, study 29, which was just published uh, in the Journal of Infectious Disease in October, um, about a 400-person trial in which patients uh, were randomized to receive either standard therapy for the first two months or a regimen in which rifapentine was substituted for rifampin at a dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, and in that study, um, there was a small advantage to the rifapentine containing arm, um, but it was very small, only 3% more sterilization, um, and that was not a statistically significant difference. Um, frankly, this was disappointing to us. Um, we looked very carefully at why this may have happened, um, and we think that um, the reason may have been that at a dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram, um, the serum levels of rifapentine in humans were not what we would have expected them to be based on animal experiments. So we have gone ahead and done another trial called 29X um, in which patients received either 15 or 20 milligrams per kilogram of rifapentine per day. These are very high doses <coughs> um, uh, of the drug. Um, uh, that study is fully enrolled. Um, we don't have results yet. We expect results from this trial uh, in the, I would say, mid, early to mid-spring of 2013, so um, March or April, something like that of 2013, we'll have the results of this trial, which, you know, looked at very high doses of rifapentine in the first two months. Um, and uh, obviously, we're, we're waiting very anxiously for those results, um, uh, and uh, we hope this trial certainly will be a positive one. Um, so that's really, I think, where rifapentine is. In, uh, in development for treatment of active TB. I will mention um, another trial. Uh, this is uh, a phase three trial. There is an idea uh, that we have been using rifamycin in general, rifampin essentially, at too low of a dose for the last 40 years. Um, or maybe to say that we're using it at really the very low end of its effective dosing range. Um, clearly, many of our patients get better. Um, but there is an idea that if we just use garden variety rifampin at a higher dose, um, we might be able to achieve much faster uh, bacterial killing um, that would allow treatment shortening. So there is a trial called Rifiquin sponsored by the European um, ED EDCTP, European Developing Countries, trial program. Um, so this is funded by the European Union, and the trials are done in the developing world, by and large. Um, and this uh, study looks at standard therapy and compares it um, to arms um, that are shorter. So there's a four-month arm you can see here, two months of standard therapy, followed by two months of rifapentine and moxifloxacin given twice weekly. Um, or an arm where you get initial standard therapy followed by four months of rifapentine and moxifloxacin given once a week. Um, this to me seems something of a high-risk trial, um, but uh, again, you know, a regimen in which um, 
which uh, higher doses of uh, rifamycins are being used potentially to shorten treatment. Carol Mitnick and colleagues from Partners in Health are looking uh, at a phase two trial in which higher doses of rifampin, uh, much higher doses than we use now, are being looked at in the first two months. So I think there's um, quite a bit of interest in more potent and higher doses of rifamycins, um, and you will start to see data from these trials in patients with drug-susceptible TB um, beginning uh, about three months from now and then continuing, I think, over the next year or so. Um, and uh, those potentially are very exciting. Now, I want to say a little bit about another drug um, that's already available. Um, uh, in the United States, we haven't used it too much for TB, um, but it has been used, um, and that's linazolid. Um, linazolid uh, belongs to the class of antibiotics called oxazolidinones. Um, this is a highly potent class of antibiotics against mycobacterium tuberculosis. And linazolid really up to now has been used only in patients with multidrug-resistant tuberculosis um, uh, since, you know, we can treat drug-susceptible TB quite satisfactorily, even though it takes a long time. These are data um, from Holly Anger and colleagues from the New York City Department of Health TB Control Program, just looking at culture conversion in a group of patients in New York City with MDR and XTR TB. Um, and it shows you that in these patients, the addition of linazolid was um, able to affect culture sterilization uh, in many patients. And, and I think those of us who have treated MDR or XDR patients with linazolid um, have observed this as well. Um, it clearly uh, is an active drug. Um, it's not easy to use um, for a whole variety of reasons. It's enormously expensive, um, and that certainly is a major issue in TB treatment around the world. Um, it has lots of uh, difficult adverse effects. So you may have seen just a couple of months ago Cliff Barry working with colleagues in South Korea um, uh, uh, reported on a relatively small group of patients, I think 40 some odd patients, with MDR TB um, who were treated with linazolid. Um, that study did report as, uh, I think, reinforcing the New York City experience that linazolid was useful in achieving um, culture conversion in a substantial number of patients. Um, but, but I think that study, Cliff Barry study, also pointed out the real risk of adverse effects. So there are two major groups of adverse effects um, with linazolid, bone marrow suppression and uh, peripheral neuropathy. And you can see um, that in Cliff Barry's study, um, really more than half of all patients who are treated with linazolid develop peripheral neuropathy. And um, this can be a difficult and not always reversible problem. Um, it was a little better if patients were treated with a dose of 300 milligrams once a day as opposed to 600 milligrams once a day. And that would be already different from the usual dose you use to treat uh, gram-positive infections uh, of 600 BID. Um, so at a low dose of 300 milligrams a day, um, still, um, more than half of patients developed uh, uh, some serious adverse effect, and at a dose of 600 once a day, almost 80% of patients had some adverse effects. So linazolid um, clearly is useful, I think, as part of a salvage regimen for the treatment of drug-resistant tuberculosis, um, but um, really is not going to be suitable um, in and of itself as uh, part of a regimen um, uh, you know, a completely novel regimen for the, for the treatment of tuberculosis overall. Okay, now I'd like to um, discuss the drugs that are not approved yet for the treatment of anything. So all the drugs we've talked about so far, rifapentine, moxifloxacin, and, and linazolid briefly, are approved for the treatment of, of some infection or another, whether it's TB or something else. But now I want to um, talk for the rest of the time about drugs that are not yet approved for the treatment of anything. And we'll start um, by talking about um, TMC-207. Now, this is a very, very exciting drug. Um, it was, uh, its uh, activity against TB was first reported in this article in Science in 2005. Um, uh, TMC-207, um, which we um, generally in shorthand refer to as J because uh, the parent company is Johnson & Johnson, but this drug now has a name. Um, which is bedaquiline, um, belongs to a class of drugs called diarylquinolines. Um, this is a, a, a class with a 
mechanism of action um, of inhibition of ATP synthase. So it interferes with energy metabolism of uh, microorganisms. Um, and for TB, this would be a completely novel mechanism of action. So there should be no TB anywhere in the world that's resistant to this, so, you know, novel mechanism of action. So in this very early study, um, it was very exciting. Um, uh, J, um, J alone here was more active than rifampin alone. The yellow bars are animals, um, uh, the, the red bar is an animal receiving um, just placebo treatment. Yellow is the number of bacteria after one month, blue the number after two months. Um, and you can see um, rifampin, you know, you get some nice killing after a month and after two months. Um, but J alone in this mice experiment was more active than even uh, rifampin. Um, and then in combinations with some other drugs you see here, J with isoniazid and pyrazinamide um, or with rifampin and pyrazinamide, complete sterilization after two months. Um, so this really got everybody's attention. It said this was back in uh, 2005. And then, sorry. Through the, um, and then uh, shortly after that, um, some more data in animal models um, uh, was released. Um, showing again that regimens containing this new drug, J or bedaquiline, um, really achieve very rapid killing in a variety of animal models. Um, again, here a regimen of J along with uh, moxifloxus and isoniazid um, and pyrazinamide. So, um, you know, a lot of activity in animals that got everyone very, very excited. Um, there have not been a great deal of data in humans yet with this drug. Um, this was uh, their trial. Um, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009, where patients with uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis were randomized um, to, uh, it wasn't really placebo, these patients received the optimal background regimen. So uh, the treating physicians designed um, what they thought was the best possible regimen in these patients with MDR-TB. Um, and to that regimen, either was added placebo or um, bedaquiline, uh, TMC-207. And you can see um, that the addition of this novel drug was able to achieve uh, culture conversion in about 45% of patients um, as compared to the patients who were receiving only optimized background therapy. Um, so this was um, the first real evidence um, in patients that uh, this was an active drug uh, against TB and potentially useful, certainly in MDR and potentially useful in other settings as well. Um, the company has done a few further studies that basically confirm that finding. This is a trial they call C208, um, and you can see that in the uh, MDR patients who got optimized background therapy plus placebo, this was the uh, percentage of culture positive patients, the patients who were converting their sputum, um, and this blue line um, was the percentage of those receiving bedaquiline, and you can see um, more patients converted their sputum, and they did so faster. So there are a limited number of patients who have been treated with this drug, um, really just a few hundred, all with multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Um, there have, and, and there, it does look as though there really is efficacy for this drug in that setting. Um, a little bit of caution, though, in the study I just showed you that so-called C208 stage two trial, um, although there were more patients who converted their sputum to negative, there were more deaths in the patients who received bedaquiline than there were in the patients who didn't. So during treatment, six patients in the bedaquiline-containing arm died. Only one patient in the uh, optimized background regimen alone arm died. Um, uh, four patients who withdrew prematurely um, died. Um, only one in the standard, in the optimized background regimen arm. So overall, by intent to treat analysis, 10 patients in the arm receiving bedaquiline had died and only two patients in the standard therapy arm. Um, now, these deaths are being examined very, very closely to try to determine if they were deaths from, from tuberculosis or deaths that might possibly have been related um, to the use of the drug. Uh, um, so that's going to be hashed out, um, I think, uh, in great, with great effort over the, the next uh, several months because um, it's an important issue. 
I think many of you probably know that two weeks ago, um, the company, Johnson & Johnson, went to the FDA. Um, they filed a new drug application. The hearing was held um, at the FDA in front of the advisory panel for this drug on November 28th. Um, and in fact, the advisory committee has recommended accelerated approval of bedaquiline for the treatment of drug-resistant tuberculosis. Now, this doesn't mean the FDA has approved it. The, the advisory panel is advisory, um, and the FDA will make the final determination. It's worth noting that the uh, advisory panel um, voted 18 to 0 that the drug was effective, um, but only 11 to 7 that the drug was safe. Um, and, so, and that's because of the, the data I just showed you re regarding deaths in that trial. Um, so the FDA will make a decision. Um, uh, but this is the drug, of all the novel drugs, this is the drug that is the closest um, to FDA approval. Um, if the drug gets approved, somehow my guess is that it will be approved by the FDA. It will be approved um, just for the treatment of, of uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis. <clears throat> um, although, of course, there's quite a bit of interest in this drug because it's so potent in animal models um, as a potential cornerstone of treatment shortening for drug-susceptible TB. Um, but of all the things we're going to talk about, this one is uh, by far the closest to approval. Um, other drugs that are moving along in the pipeline, um, uh, and all of these drugs are now being studied first in patients with multidrug resistant TB. So this drug, OPC67683, um, made by a Japanese pharmaceutical company called Otsuka. This drug also now has a name called Dalamanid. Um, this belongs to the chemical class called um, uh, nitroamidazoles. Um, and uh, you might be familiar with this class, as I'll mention in a little bit, um, metronidazole belongs to this class of drugs. Um, so OPC67683 was identified several years ago. Um, its mechanism of action Probably, you don't have to worry too much about the details of this slide, but probably um, uh, involves inhibition of mycolic acid biosynthesis and so would be disruptive um, to the cell wall of mycobacteria. Um, and uh, as I said, um, interestingly enough, belongs to the same class of drugs as metronidazole, metronidazole and I just threw this in. Um, people may have seen this, a very recent paper in PNAS in which using a monkey model of latent tuberculosis, metronidazole was effective in preventing reactivation of, of TB um, in this monkey model. Um, I am not aware that uh, there are any clinical trials at the moment planned for metronidazole um, in the treatment of either latent or active TB in humans. Um, but uh, this is a very interesting report and I think supports the idea that this class of drugs might be useful against TB. So um, back to OPC67683, uh, I'm sorry it looks to me like this slide uh, is not so easy to see, but in, in, in animal experiments similar to those I've showed you for a lot of other um, agents, uh, it did appear that this novel agent um, had some advantages to standard drugs, um, and uh, OPC67683 or delaminate has moved into phase two clinical trials. Sorry. Um, has moved into phase two clinical trials, and there was this very recent publication <clears throat> in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, again, where patients with multidrug-resistant tuberculosis were randomized to receive an optimized background regimen plus placebo or optimized background regimen plus delaminid. Um, and you can see um, in liquid medium and in solid medium um, both that the addition of delaminid um, did increase culture sterilization um, in these patients with MDR-TB, um, along roughly, uh, or roughly with a similar magnitude as, as TMC206 um, did. <clears throat> um, so another promising agent. This is my understanding that the company, this company I believe is going to seek approval in Europe before it seeks approval in the United States. So uh, as far as I know, um, there's no uh, FDA hearing in the near future schedule for this drug, I, I believe the company is going to go to Europe first to seek approval. Finally, the other um, drug that I want to mention that's moving through the clinical pipeline is another nitroimidazole, 
PA824. This one is being sponsored by the, by the TB Alliance. Um, this drug's not quite so far along as uh, the other two that I've shown you, um, but um, again, a very recent paper in The Lancet um, looking at a number of novel agents in an early phase two study. These are so-called early bactericidal activity studies where patients with smear positive tuberculosis um, receive uh, these drugs either alone or in combination um, daily for one or two weeks. Sputum is collected every day and then um, quantitative colony counts are done from those sputum cultures um, and the change uh, in the number of, of colony forming units is, is plotted every day. Um, uh, so this slide points out a few interesting things. Bedaquiline, TMC207, in the first week has no early bacteri uh, bactericidal activity at all. Um, and, and it's very puzzling as, as to how actually this, this drug works. Um, but we know, as I showed you already, it does work. Um, uh, and I think to a certain degree it demonstrates relatively limited information you can get from these EBA studies. But um, having said that, um, PA824, um, this, uh, the Alliance's novel uh, nitroimidazole, in combination with pyrazinamide and moxifloxacin, has much better early bactericidal activity than many other combinations uh, of drugs, including um, the purple line here, which is essentially standard therapy. through the pipeline. Um, I just want to say a little bit, I mentioned linazolid, which um, is active, but will never, I think, be suitable on a large scale for the treatment of, of TB, certainly drug susceptible TB. Um, but Pfizer has a drug called PNU100-480, which now also has a name, sutazolid. Um, which is another oxazolidinone, a cousin of linazolid, um, and that is now in, in early phase clinical trials. Um, so perhaps AstraZeneca has a similar drug, um, so perhaps the companies will be able to identify and develop drugs that retain the anti-TB activity of linazolid but without um, the adverse effects. Um, one of the questions that, be, that comes up and is really uh, a segue to what I want to mention next, um, is of course we don't treat tuberculosis with drugs. We treat tuberculosis with regimens of many drugs. Um, and it would be of course great to have any of these new agents to be able to help our patients with multidrug resistant TB, but overall when we talk about treatment shortening, we're talking about the development of completely novel regimens that we could use to treat both drug resistant um, and drug susceptible TB, so-called universal regimens. Um, and just to show you um, what might be able to be achieved, um, again, these are uh, data from the animal model um, where you have drugs, for example, this arm here, um, JZL, this is uh, TMC207 or bedaquiline plus pyrazinamide plus linazolid, and you can see how much more active that is than this bar here which is standard therapy. Um, so I think that's really where the excitement comes out. Um, or here's uh, bedaquiline, pyrazinamide, and moxifloxacin, um, or bedaquiline, pyrazinamide, and uh, rifapentine. Um, um, this is really, I think, where the excitement is, where you think about combining um, these novel drugs into regimens that really look spectacularly active in animal models and raise the potential um, for really serious treatment shortening uh, in humans. Um, but it's difficult to do these studies. Um, uh, you know, once you get into phase two studies, phase two B studies, like I showed you our TBTC trials, um, which have three to 400 patients in them, you have to choose the regimen uh, carefully. The studies take months to years. Then you move into phase three studies, which are very large studies, phase three trials, um, where the outcomes are failure, relapse. You have to follow the patients for at least a year or maybe two after completion of therapy to determine relapse rates. Um, and these studies have somewhere between 1,500 and 2,500 patients in them. Um, they're very large. And again, um, you know, choosing the regimens, picking which novel agents can um, be combined uh, in a novel regimen is very, very difficult on a number of levels. Um, first of all, you need the companies to cooperate to allow 
uh, more than one novel agent into a regimen, um, you probably need to do preclinical testing and, and phase one pharmacokinetic studies to look at the influence of those novel agents on each other, much less the other drugs in the regimen. Um, so these are very, very complicated, costly, time-consuming, uh, intellectually difficult studies to do. And that really gets me to the, the last bit that I want to talk about, um, which is the overall uh, context um, for TB trials. And I want to mention here, it looks like this slide got cut off a little bit, um, what I think is one of the most important publications um, uh, in tuberculosis, uh, in the whole tuberculosis world. It's now done every year um, by the Treatment Action Group, um, which is their report on tuberculosis research funding trends. And they've been doing this since 2005. Um, and the new report was just released um, uh, and launched at the union meeting in Malaysia last month. And I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, on this slide. The, the green um, bars here are targets sent by the global plan, um, the, the WHO's global plan for the elimination of TB, um, on what investments in research would be needed um, to, to achieve what we want to achieve um, in TB elimination around the world. So WHO uh, the Global Plan estimates, for example, we need $420 million in, in basic research a year, um, and currently uh, investment around the world, and this is every last nickel from every last funder, um, including NIH, Gates, Pharma, um, other philanthropies, other governments, is only about $120 million out of a, a need of $400 million. Um, for new drugs, it's estimated that we need about $750 million a year to move along as rapidly as we would like. There's only about 250 million um, uh, in the pipeline for that. Um, and looked at another way, if you look at all tuberculosis research and development funding um, in the world uh, for the last several years, again, this is every last nickel um, as far as the Treatment Action Group or TAG can determine. And this is, they do a very good job in this study. It's really comprehensive. Um, basically, for the last three years, this there's been uh, uh, almost a trivial increase um, in the amount of spending. So um, it's just under, uh, it's about $680,000, um, nowhere near what the projections are for what we think we need to treat, uh, to, to uh, invest in, in TB research. Um, and I think this is really holding us back in a significant way. Just um, to compare, um, for example, AIDS uh, research, um, just from NIH, age research just from NIH is about $3 billion a year. Um, just, just from NIH, just for that one disease. And to go back again, um, TB research from everywhere in the world is less than $700 million. So NIH alone um, spends uh, about five times what the entire world spends on tuberculosis. NIH spends for AIDS more than five times what the entire world spends for TB. Um, and people should keep that in mind and, you know, call your congressman, really. Um, you know, TB, as I mentioned at the outset, is one of the great public health problems in the world. So I think I'll end here. Um, my uh, summary and conclusions are that the good news is that there are more drugs in, in the clinical pipeline um, for TB um, than at any time in the last 40 years. As I told you, bedaquilin um, is on the verge of approval and will be the first new uh, class of TB drugs since the rifamycins um, 40 years ago, and that's extremely exciting. Um, but there are many challenges in TB drug development, including um, how do we combine novel agents, um, a need for much more capacity in uh, TB clinical trials around the world, um, the length and complexity of these TB trials, and then, of, of course, funding. Um, uh, so I think I'll stop there, and thanks for your attention, and I guess now we'll uh, take questions. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so very much, Neil. That was a fantastic uh, talk, and I want to go ahead and open it up to uh, everyone in our audience who uh, might have questions. Please go ahead and use your uh, Q&A uh, feature on the Adobe Connect uh, um, presentation uh, field that you have there on your screen. Uh, Neil, I tell you, if, if uh, we could, I didn't want to sound campy and have one person clapping here, but I'm sure that's one of the downsides of doing this is that uh, I think it was a fantastic talk, and you can only hear me clapping, if anything. So uh, again, we really, really appreciate your, uh, 
your presentation, very factual. And as we're waiting for some questions to come in on, online, I, I do have a, a couple of them. Um, on uh, several of the studies, looking at uh, TBTC uh, studies 27 and 28, as well as re, uh, Remox and Oflatub, uh, um, did those studies take into account um, the uh, disease burden uh, with regard to culture conversion rate at two months? So, for example, were they all just smear positives that were analyzed um, or cavitary disease or, or what? Um, also stratify the analysis by uh, presence of cavitary disease or not. Um, and as you would expect, um, patients with cavitary disease are slower to convert. Um, uh, we also saw in study 27, and I think to a bit in study 28, that patients from Africa generally converted their sputum culture um, more slowly than patients um, outside of our African sites. About half of the patients in, in all of our trials uh, 27, 28, and 29 um, are enrolled in Africa, principally in Uganda um, and some in South Africa. Um, so yes, uh, we didn't look at it in terms of smear grading, you know, one plus versus four plus, um, but we did look at it in terms of cavitary disease, and they're slower. Okay, but but you did look at maybe not smear grading, but you saw sort of like the dichotomous variable where you looked at smear positive versus smear negative. Correct? Well, we only had smear positive patients. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Great. And then, and I'm sure you've had the relapse and recurrence data in those two studies that you had. You presented the data about two-month conversion rates, but I'm sure that the relapse and recurrence data between the uh, MOXIE-containing regimen and the EMB-containing regimens, were those any different with uh, relapse and recurrence? Right. So it's a good question. We actually, in those trials, have not looked at that because, um, you know, these were phase two trials and we were just looking at this sort of intermediate endpoint of culture conversion at two months. Um, uh, you know, I think if we had all the time and money in the world, we would have looked at that, but we don't really have that data um, in a meaningful way. Okay. Great. Great. Well, uh, just a reminder that we've uh, got it open for uh, Q&A. Um, in the past, we've had the phone lines open for that, but we're uh, using the uh, uh, QA feature on, on the uh, Adobe Connect. So just go ahead and share any other questions that you have. But another, another question that we have that uh, came in that was has to do with one of your later slides, um, Neil, that uh, showed the slide showing combining novel agents in the treatment of TB in a murine model and kind of, I think it was quoting the Tassin uh, uh, paper from last year. Right. And uh, what I noticed there was that all of the sort of uh, more effective regimens and looking at uh, standard therapy, all of them contained um, pyrazinamide. And I know uh, pyrazinamide has had a lot of attention lately as far as uh, maybe getting a, a little bit more respect than it has in uh, the traditional regimen. Can you comment a little bit about um, sort of the um, sort of role that PZA might be filling in and sort of its uh, novel, not really novel mechanism of action, but sort of its enhanced mechanism of action with the new drugs and, and what role it might play in, in, in these new regimens? Yes, that's a great question. So um, you're right, you know, from the BMRC trials, we were pretty sure that pyrazinamide really didn't do anything after the first two months of therapy. I mean, that was examined in a number of trials um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, and that's why we dropped PZA now in our regimen when we're treating drug-susceptible TB. Um, as I said, those, those, some of those studies were done. It really didn't seem to do anything. Um, but there, there is a school of thought that says um, that, may, that may not actually be true, particularly in combination um, with, uh, with some of these novel agents. And so I think you're going to see um, a lot of studies now in which pyrazinamide is continued for the duration of treatment um, in, in studies that are trying to shorten overall um, treatment duration. So uh, yeah, I think it's true. It's making something of a comeback. Um, uh, I want to say something else. Um, I mean, it's hard. Um, it's been hard to study pyrazinamide. Um, it's, it's probably, on a routine basis, the most difficult drug to test for, you know, of the first-line drugs for drug susceptibility because it's active only in an acid pH and the conditions have to be just so um, and things like that. But people are really starting to look at this um, now, and, and I know there are a number of efforts uh, um, underway to look at the impact of pyrazinamide resistance, for example. 
um, in outcomes of patients treated who otherwise seem to have drug susceptible TB. So yeah, I think you're going to see pyrazinamide uh, make a comeback. The other drug, which may be making a comeback, although I have to say I'm, I'm more skeptical on this one, is clofazamine. Um, clofazamine, in combination with certain things like um, J, like bedaquiline, um, really looks like it has a lot of activity. But that's a very difficult drug to use um, because of side effects, particularly hyperpigmentation of the skin. So I'm not so sure about that one. Um, but peers in mind, uh, I think so. Well, great. Well, I've uh, got some uh, questions coming in uh, online. So one of the questions that came in is that looking at, uh, you know, a lot of the studies that you showed were pretty much looking at mouse models uh, to study human disease and therapeutics. And the question is, is that are mouse models uh, the best model to use? Right. So. Um, Maybe Cliff Barry is listening um, on this or, or someone who works for him. So there's been a big argument um, or an argument about this um, lately. There is no great animal model of tuberculosis, um, certainly no great mouse model. There are a number of different mouse models. Um, the standard thing is you take a mice, usually C57 black six mice, and um, you infect them with TB and then you, know, you start treating them. Mice don't really get latent TB the way people get latent TB. Um, uh, they don't really get cavities the way people get cavities. So mice tuberculo mouse tuberculosis is not exactly the same as people tuberculosis. Um, on the other hand, in I think a broad way, mice have been generally predictive of um, certain TB regimen, the, the uh, effectiveness of certain TB regimens in humans. I mean, the, our rifapentine study for latent TB that I discussed early on in the talk um, was designed, you know, based in part by studies that were done in mice that suggested that highly intermittent therapy might work. Um, so I think the mice are useful and are broadly predictive. I think it's probably fair to say that if drugs have no activity in mice, they are unlikely to have activity in people. Um, the question is, on the other end, if drugs are really effective in mice, is that enough to go into humans? And here's where there's been a bit of an argument, and particularly Cliff Barry, who's at NIH, um, and did that linazolid study I mentioned, um, and is working with colleagues in Korea, has been critical of the mouse model. The question is, what else could you use? Um, Joanne Flynn, at, I showed that metronidazole study, Joanne Flynn and colleagues at Pittsburgh have used monkeys, macaque monkeys or synomologous monkeys. Um, and they may be better. I mean, they're certainly evolutionarily more close to us um, than our mice. Um, the problem with primates, of course, is that they're very, very expensive. Um, and it's hard for me to believe that on a large scale um, they'll be they'll take over from mice in preclinical testing. But it's a really good, good question, and I think probably a lot more work needs to be done um, in figuring out, you know, among mice, which are the best mice to use. Um, but it's a, it's a really good question. Yeah, I, I think it is, and could probably be the subject of a, just an entire webinar in and of itself, and uh, a lot more than that. Because yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just sitting here thinking of questions to tack on, and we can uh, we can go on. But we've uh, got a, a number of other questions as well. Um, sort of shifting gears a little bit. Another question we've got that came in is that um, the question is is that do the other investigational uh, nitroamidazoles have similar peripheral neuropathy risk com comparable to uh, prolonged flagell usage? Um, I would say there's not enough data in people yet to know. Um, uh, there have been some safety issues with um, with uh, all of these drugs, um, but um, the remember that up to now. The, uh, the other, uh, another question that came in was a uh, point of clarification, uh, I believe, on one of your earlier slides. The question is that when you were speaking about current therapy, which I think was on, on some of the intro slides, you said that an advantage was low relapse rate, but then said a disadvantage was the high uh, relapse rate. And um, if you can kind of clarify that a little bit uh, there, I think some right. people... So what I, what I um, meant to say, if you look at um, 
uh, U.S. Public Health Service Study 21, which was published, I think, in 1986 in The Lancet, which um, really was one of the studies that got, got us to the six-month regimen we have now, and subsequent studies. Um, overall, it looks like the relapse rate with our standard regimen is in the 3 to 4 percent range. But if you, if you look at patients with drug-susceptible TB um, who have extensive bilateral cavitary disease or, and or um, weigh less than 90 percent of ideal body weight at the initiation of therapy and or um, take more than two months to become culture negative. So if you take any two of those three risk factors, right, any two of those three things, and you treat patients for only six months with the regimen we, we use standardly, then the relapse rate will be in the 10 to 15 percent range. Um, so there's still a need to individualize therapy, I think. Uh, that's the point I was trying to make. Got it. Yeah, I, I think that um, we'll end up seeing that depending on the circumstances and the program and other issues related to the patient, clearly end up seeing that. Um, there's a, sort of a, an amalgam of questions that are coming through that I'm kind of kind of synthesized together related to uh, adverse effects of the new medication. And so, for example, you did mention about uh, the death seen in bedaquiline, and there were some other questions related to some of the adverse effects of the new medications. Uh, some of those are class-related, but um, perhaps it might be helpful to a lot of our uh, participants if you can kind of touch on what some of the um, broad categories of uh, risk factors that are known so far with relation to uh, the newer drugs. I'd imagine the Daquilin, the Laminid, and uh, Cetazolid primarily. Right. So, um, the Daquilin, um, the FDA is, is uh, concerned quite a bit about QT prolongation. Um, and so that's going to be looked at very, very closely. And um, QT prolongation, um, you know, has been an issue also with quinolone. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I don't consider myself a, a great expert in this field, but um, the, the, um, there may be sort of an additive effect when you start combining drugs, you know, that, that individually can cause QT prolongation. And so that's something the FDA is going to be looking at very, very carefully um, in the treatment of these drugs. Um, Sutazolid, there have been some questions about liver function abnormalities in the early testing of that drug um, uh, as well, um, although that's, Sutazolid is, um, that's the novel um, oxazolidinone, the linazolid cousin. Um, so there have been questions, uh, I said, about LFT abnormalities, which also is a major concern of FDA. FDA um, always, you know, they, obviously they care about all adverse effects, but they're particularly attuned to liver function abnormalities, QT prolongation. And so, um, you know, those have been issues really for a lot of the um, drugs moving through the pipeline. Great. Well, there's another question here that I, I, I have to fight the temptation to put in my two cents, and I, I might uh, end up still doing that at the end here. But it's an uh, interesting question that comes and says, a uh, very important point, says rifapentine and INH for latent TB is a true advancement. However, an operation is provisioned for DOT uh, makes it burdensome for local health departments to implement. Um, any other options uh, in view? Okay, so um, I'll say a couple of things uh, about that. Um, I was one of the investigators in that trial, and as I mentioned, I was the steering committee chair for the consortium um, during the whole time of that trial. Um, uh, and I'm going to speak now as just a doc who takes care of patients with TB, <laughs> not, not in my, um, uh, I'm not a representative of CDC for this. Um, I think most of us who were investigators in that trial understood that the reason we gave the experimental arm by DOT was because we wanted to know if it worked. Um, you know, patients self-administer drugs all the time, and some of those drugs are dangerous. Um, I, I personally um, am not any more concerned that a patient will take the entire 12 doses all at once than I would be that they take an entire bottle of isoniazid all at once. Um, and I had a patient do that once many years ago. Um, or they took 10 a day and then ran out of their isoniazid in three days. Um, so, so we gave it by DOT mostly to see if it worked, um, and it clearly works. Um, the CDC, in their endorsement of the regimen, has said that it should be given by DOT because that's how it was done in the trial. Um, and it's true that we don't know what the efficacy is if you only take five or six or seven of the doses instead of 12, and I think people are worried about that. But as I said, when we give isoniazid, you know, we know 
um, that no more than half of patients are ever going to complete that regimen or take it the way we suggested it being, that it be taken, and we don't insist that that be given by DOT. Um, um, at the moment, it's a little bit hard to get rifapentine, um, so that may make the regimen a little bit difficult. Um, but again, my feeling is it's not in and of itself dangerous to let a patient with latent TB um, self-administer a weekly regimen, and, and I don't really hesitate to do that. Now, we are interested in this as an operational research question, and we are enrolling in a trial in which patients are So we're asking that operational question. In terms of other regimens that are out there, or maybe out there soon, that simplify treatment for LTBI, um, I think people are aware there's uh, a large trial of four months of rifampin daily. And that regimen's been studied a couple of times, um, but in smaller trials that indicate that it looks safe, but not trials that are big enough to see if it's effective. Um, and then potentially our consortium is interested in something like six weeks of daily rifapentine, um, but that's still on the drawing board. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that, actually, self-administration versus DOT. Yeah, I was um, at the, uh, the CDC consultation related to that, and I, you know, and again, someone who's doing TB control uh, in, you know, for the state, um, you know, I feel that from a safety standpoint, I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, we give people very dangerous medicines that they take on their own or not take, and, you know, there are consequences related to that. And I think on that point, it goes over to the idea of personal responsibility. But I think from an operational standpoint and sort of from a programmatic standpoint, you, you know, you stick with what's been studied because it is a somewhat limited resource um, and it is challenging. And when you look at sort of, an, and I don't know that there have been any studies that have looked at this yet, it's still too early, but I think that um, doing DOT, it's, it's very effective. And when you look at completion rates that can be duplicated, and we're starting to see that in our own experience uh, in Florida with more widespread use of rifapentine, in particular one uh, um, outbreak setting that we have, um, we've got completion rates that are going to start to be very, very high, and I think that we're going to see some benefits from that. My concern only is that if we go to um, self-administered as sort of a standard, um, you know, we're, you know, we'll cease, cease to be leading on this point because I think then we'll start to, to fall by the wayside uh, with regard to the uh, uh, effectiveness, and we'll look and say, well, if the pension's not got that great, you know, it really wasn't the big... You know, um, sort of magic bullet that we are looking for, and although not a magic bullet, I think it will have very important uh, implications. Now, that's not to say that there shouldn't be studies to look at, you know, shorter regimens, and certainly studies that look at self-administered and compare uh, compare INH nine months self-administered with you know 12 weeks of uh, self-administered once weekly INH and repentine. Certainly, I think that needs to be done, but the data right now supports DOT, and, and I've. I'm kind of uh, very devoted to DOT and think that, uh, that you know, most programs can make it work in one way or another. Yeah, and then certainly um, I've been a, I'm a DOT uh, believer um, uh, as well. I think um, what we all hope, uh, and I think there's a reasonable possibility that the price of rifapentine will come down. The company I know has asked FDA for a change in the label, um, and so if they get that as an indication, um, it'll make uptake of that regimen, I think, much easier, and, and that should make the price come down, so I hope that will happen. Good, good. No, I didn't realize that. I think that's a very important point as well. Well, kind of uh, moving along along the side of um, issues related to, uh, since we're talking about the rifamycins, there's another question here now that brings up a point that reminds me of a lot of conversations that I've had uh, with Chuck Pelliquin re related to uh, rifampin and kind of the, uh, where we get the dosing for it and kind of the, the, the scientific basis of that. Um, the question here that uh, kind of points back and says that you said that we, in, we in quotation marks, may be underdosing with rifampin uh, for the continuation phase. Um, what dose uh, would you recommend um, based on kind of the information that you've, you've got, got here? Right. Well, well I first, uh, you know, currently I wouldn't recommend doing anything other than what we currently do, um, you know, which is 600 milligrams of rifampin a day. But if you look... Um, at the animal studies and even some early human studies um, of rifampin, um, you kind of fall off a cliff 
of rifampin efficacy at a dose below 450 milligrams a day. Um, uh, and 600 is not too far away from that. Um, so as I mentioned, um, Carol Mitnick is looking at, at higher doses, you know, like 900 a day and more um, of rifampin because, as I said, if you, if you comb through the BMRC studies and some animal data, um, it looks like those doses might be well tolerated um, and could really give you a lot more killing. So I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think there's any circumstance now where on a routine basis I would use, you know, higher doses of rifampin. Um, uh, I think if you had a patient, let's say, with drug susceptible TB and they were on standard regimen, they weren't getting better and you wanted to do something like send serum levels um, and the rifampin serum levels were low, you could increase the dose on that basis. But even that, I think, is somewhat controversial. But um, um, but there's no question that we are close to the to the bottom of rifampin dosing in terms of its efficacy. As I said, below 450 milligrams, you really fall off a cliff. Um, uh, and so, you know, people really are interested in higher doses. Chuck Peliquin has talked a lot about this as well. So, uh, yeah. so you know, and and I think what seems a little bit encouraging is that these higher doses might be pretty well tolerated. Um, in our study that we just finished, the rifapentine trial, uh, phase two study where we gave 15 or 20 milligrams per kilograms a day of rifapentine, which is a, a very high dose, um, we don't have the results from that yet. All I can say is that the DSMB didn't stop the study at any point. I, I, I don't want to overinterpret that to assume that it was safe, but um, that's what I'm hoping. Right, right. And, and in that one study, I'm trying to find my notes from uh, earlier, um, did, were there, um, the, the one that showed that the 10 milligrams per kilogram was not as effective, did that, was PK, were PK studies done during the study? Because I know it was kind of what, what expected, but they were done, and, and were the levels within normal range, or were they low? Right, so, so um, in that, I w um, so just to point out again, the 10 milligrams per kilogram was as effective as standard therapy was more effective than rifampin. So it wasn't worse, but it wasn't better. Right, and we did PK during that study, um, and the serum levels um, were lower than we f were expecting them to be based on the animal data. Um, and uh, so we think we didn't achieve the rifapentine exposure that we thought we needed to, to really um, affect a, a major change in culture or conversion. Okay. And that's Great. why we went ahead and, and increased the dose in the second study. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, moving along, some other uh, questions, kind of trying to get a group of them together to kind of touch base on things. One of the uh, questions relates to uh, metronidazole, um, knowing that its mechanism of action is, you know, traditionally, or not mechanism of action, but its um, role has been mostly to treat anaerobic infections and brings up a larger question. The, so OPC 67686, the uh, delaminate, I, I showed a little bit of data. It looks like it may inhibit mycolic acid synthesis and so be a, an inhibitor of cell wall synthesis overall. Um, so, you know, um, mycolic acids are an important part of the cell wall of, of MTB. Um, so that, as far as anyone knows, that's the best guess about its mechanism of action is mycolic acid uh, synthesis inhibition. Okay. And then the other one, just sort of revisiting the uh, issue about the, an appropriate animal model, um, another questioner brought in the question related to um, uh, use of guinea pigs potentially for, for active disease uh, as a model as opposed to mice or, or even the primates. Yeah, um, guinea pigs have been used, guinea pigs are extremely susceptible to tuberculosis and people, uh, you know, are probably aware of the studies that were done, you know, going back a long time with uh, Richard Riley at Hopkins and now Ed Nordell. Um, up in Boston, sort of redoing these studies, um, using guinea pigs to assess infectiousness. You know, you put a guinea pig um, in in a cage in the room with someone who has TB. You know, and the guinea pig doesn't get TB, um, then you're pretty sure the person's not infectious um, anymore. Um, I don't know that there's been a lot of work looking at guinea pigs as a treatment model. I'm, I'm just not familiar. There may be, and I just don't know. Um, the other animal model, small animal model, people have looked at is rabbits. Um, rabbits have been useful for studying granuloma formation, among other things. Um, but by far, the, my, the mouse is the, is the one that's been used the most, the most experienced. Um, uh, 
So I, th I think that's the state of affairs. Yeah, and I, my understanding was that just because of the exquisite sensitivity of uh, guinea pigs to TB, where just even you know theoretically just one organism can then progress to miliary disease and death, and, and guinea pigs makes it very difficult uh, as a model. But right, that's right. Yeah, to go as quickly. So now this uh, this kind of makes it complete. I I myself have never given a talk to my recollection about TB or the future of TB, where somehow BCG or vaccination. Um, uh, the future vaccination comes up. And so one questioner brings up, again, a little bit outside the scope, but certainly very, very closely related to this, is that um, any uh, update on the uh, role of vaccines and, and its potential interaction with regard to the drug development and, and vaccines as a potential treatment versus uh, potential prevention as well? Yeah, so um, I guess two things to say. There was... Uh, one thing to add, um, so there, there are phase two trials of novel vaccines underway in the world. And this is not an area I work in myself. Vaccines are the only area I haven't worked in. So um, uh, I'll just tell you what I know. But, but there are um, phase two trials underway of a vaccine candidate um, that overexpresses an antigen called uh, antigen 85, which is felt by many people to be immunogenic. Um, uh, and those studies um, are, are being done. There may be other candidates um, as well that I don't know about, but the uh, antigen 85 studies are, are the furthest along. As I said, they're phase two studies. The problem, and, and there's a fair amount of activity in vaccine development, um, a lot of it being directed by the ARIS TB Vaccine Foundation in, in D.C., which is funded largely by the Bill and the Gates Foundation. Um, there are real scientific hurdles to vaccine work. Um, the two major ones are that, um, first of all, we really don't know how to tell if any human being is immune to tuberculosis. Um, and that makes it very hard to know if the vaccine works. You know, if you want to know if you have a vaccine that makes you immune to chickenpox, it's relatively straightforward in this day and age. You give the vaccine and you look for varicella neutralizing antibodies. We don't have an assay like that for TB. So that's been an enormous hurdle to vaccine development. You know, how do you really know if the vaccine has worked other than giving it to 50,000 people and, and waiting, you know, five or ten years to see who gets TB? The second is something we've been talking about, which is um, there's no great animal model um, for immunity to tuberculosis either. And so those two things have really held up vaccine work. But nonetheless, um, people are pressing ahead. Um, uh, and, you know, in the next several years, I think we'll start to see results from those trials. Um, I don't, that, that's about all I know about that. There was um, also an interesting report um, from Ford von Rhein and Bob Horsberg about M. vacci in patients with HIV infection, um, in which it appeared that that vaccine appeared to have some efficacy. Um, for some reason, that study hasn't attracted a great deal of attention. Um, and as I said, vaccine's not an area I work in, so I don't know why, but that's about, I think that that's what's going on in vaccines. Yeah, I know about probably about 10 years ago, it seemed like the vaccine dr new drug race was going to be won by vaccines, but it seems uh, just that some of the immunologic challenges have really um, kind of, I don't want to say fallen by the wayside, but this has been a, a big stumbling block compared to disease um, that's mostly controlled by cell-mediated immunity. You know, that's TB, right. malaria, HIV. Those are all very challenging diseases right. for vaccine development. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I don't, uh, under what, what is normally a very optimistic topic, and, you know, we've covered a lot here that I think gives us a lot of hope for the future. I don't want to be kind of uh, Debbie Downer and just bring up the fact that no disease has ever been eliminated, no infectious disease has ever been eliminated without the use of a vaccine. Right. And so I think somewhere that's going to have to play an important part in the future, but uh, that, that remains to be seen. I um, uh, just want to remind everyone we still have plenty of time, so keep your uh, questions coming in. And I've got a, another one, uh, Neil, that's uh, on a drug that um, you know, is part of standard therapy, and it's one of those things that kind of reminds me that uh, there's a lot in TB that we do just because we've always done it and don't always come back and ask the questions. Uh, but the question is posed to us, it states, as, uh, why is ethambutol not an effective drug 
in the induction phase. I, I, I would think that it's overshadowed by INH and rifampin's activity, but if you can comment on that, that would be uh, very helpful. Yeah, I think that's it. It's just a less potent drug. Um, uh, you know, we use ethambutol in the induction phase um, really, um, I mean, if you, if you do induction phase therapy the, well, the way I think most of us do it, which is daily for the first two months, um, ethambutol adds nothing to INH, rifampin, and pyrazinamide um, in the induction phase. It's in there really just to protect against the possibility that you have um, drug resistance, particularly isonized, re isonized resistance, so that if you know to begin with you have drug susceptible isolate and you're going to do daily therapy in the induction phase, you don't have to use ethambutol at all. Um, you do have to use it if you use a so-called Denver regimen, you know, highly intermittent therapy throughout the induction phase, but it's just, for whatever reason, a less potent drug. Um, I think its mechanism of action also is inhibition of cell wall synthesis, um, but a less potent drug. There is, there is an ethambutol analog um, in the pipeline, I didn't talk about it, SQ109, made by Sequela. Um, uh, it's lagging behind some of the other uh, things that we did talk about. Yeah, it, it seemed to come out of the gates pretty quickly, but it's been uh, been a little bit slower, it seems, moving forward. Yeah. And and when I talk to patients, kind of talking about their, their therapy, I will many times refer to ethambutol as the insurance policy. You know, I'm just using it to protect the other drugs, essentially, exactly. and that, that it's, you know, and especially with the doses that we give, it's it's not going to have the big uh, big overall big overall impact. And that may be it. I mean, a lot of people. I think there is a tendency to dose ethambutol on the low side. You know, it's dosing range 15 to 25 milligrams per kilogram. Um, I think a lot of people do dose it on the low side because they're worried about uh, adverse effects. Um, and maybe that's part of what limits its uh, effectiveness. I don't I don't know. Yeah, certainly 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 could be because I I usually will try to go uh, on the low end of that myself with uh, with treating patients. Um, one other thing, just kind of as a broad, a broad category, I think that, you know, getting back to the issue of potential toxicities of the drugs, and since uh, bedaquin seems to be pretty close uh, to approval here, uh, when is the data related to some of the adverse effects that occurred during the trials, when is that analysis going to be done? And I'm assuming that that will be done as part of the uh, FDA ap approval process, and, and that will kind of come out. But when is, the, uh, when is that going to come out? Right, so um, the, the data I showed, for example, were from the FD filing um, made by the company. That's publicly available. You can go on the web and, and get the whole company filing um, and, and the analysis of sort of each individual death, um, uh, and people can look at it. I, you know, there, there have there only been a few hundred patients who have been treated with this drug, um, and one always worries about safety when only a relatively small number of patients have been treated. Um, but anybody who wants can, um, you can, if you just search, uh, you know, Bedaquilin FDA, you'll find, you'll find the company's filing and you, you can read the, the, the safety analysis that's available uh, up to date for those patients. Uh, you know, four of the patients died after they were withdrawn um, uh, and a lot of those deaths are attributed to just progression of TB. Um, but anytime you see an imbalance in arms, it makes you a little nervous. But, but people can certainly go and read the whole filing. Right. Okay, well, good. Well, it's, it, it'll be, it's exciting nonetheless, and I, I think uh, obviously there's always things that we find out post-marketing just from the natural uh, sort of use in a broader programmatic setting so will kind of give us a lot of information as well. So. And I think for these drugs, that's especially true, and that's a really important point, Mike, because um, when these drugs get available, uh, get approved for MDRTB, which is how they're going to get approved, they will have been approved, uh, um, you know, with much less clinical experience than the average drug gets approved with. And so the post-marketing surveillance for adverse effects is going to be really important. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how programs react to some of the use of You know, MDR is still an issue, relatively small issue, because we've been fortunate enough to be able to have uh, an infrastructure that can support, you know, DOT, prevention of MDR. But functional MDR is a bigger problem that sometimes gets overlooked when you look at funding and you look at, well, you only have, you know, 100 and some odd MDR cases nationally. But functional MDR, that is people that have, um, say, INH resistance and had a toxic reaction or a FAMP and or vice versa or whatever it might be, 
is a much larger number. And so the temptation or the need to use some of these newer drugs will be very valuable. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say that there's an overwhelming number, but there's a substantial number of patients that require some sort of non-INH and rifampin regimen, uh, pe not because of true MDR, but because they're functionally MDR. Um, it'll be interesting to see how these drugs kind of get rolled out, because I think in our setting in the United States, I think that's where we will end up seeing as much, if not more, more use of this. Yeah. And, uh, yeah it's, and, and one of the things I think also is um, another question related that, that didn't come up is that uh, what role will these drugs have potentially in non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections? So obviously there's some overlap um, and some over, uh, um, overlap with regard to their uh, mechanism of action, but many of these are going to be specific to TB. Can you comment on that or is there any data to support what its role for some of these new drugs might be for the non-tuberculous mycobacteria? Oh, there's been almost nothing um, looked at for that. So uh, I'm not aware of any clinical trial data so far for any of these things for non-tuberculous mycobacteria. I mean, talk about the orphan diseases of all time. Um, right. Except they're not orphan. I mean, they're, they're a lot more common than TB. Um, in the U.S., you know, I, I could show you a thousand patients with uh, MAC infection that yeah. who, with, whom I have no idea how to treat, but uh, that's another story for another day. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, uh, if these uh, drugs can uh, kind of have a role with uh, sort of um, uh, addressing that, um, you know, maybe having a role in that group. Cause it's a, yeah, although I think market. at the beginning there's going to be, particularly for these drugs that are getting approved for MDR-TB, there's going to be a lot of jealousy about protecting them for TB. You know, as I, as I mentioned um, early on, it's to me it's really striking that in some parts of the world a lot of TB is resistant to quinolones, um, and quinolones aren't used to treat TB. Um, on a routine basis anywhere, and it's just because it, they're just they're just there, and, and people use them like water, and, and everything becomes resistant to them. So, yeah, yeah, and I, I think that Tim Sterling's uh, work on that, kind of pointing out some of the sort of looking at the ATS IDSA guidelines with regard to using quinolones frontline therapy, where people, if they don't necessarily look at the risk factors that a patient might have, and maybe the history may not be as um, accurate as it could be a lot of TB patients end up getting treated with quinolones, and that probably is something that gets replicated internationally on a, on a very large scale and probably leads to a lot of that. It's, uh, it's interesting in, in how, how, where we might be with uh, losing some drugs. But um, we're uh, coming close to the end here. A couple more questions real quick. Um, one of them, I, I think I took notes to confirm this, but someone asked when the uh, results are expected for uh, study 29X, and I wrote down March 2013. Is that uh, about right? Um, we expect to have them then um, when we would present them. You know, we'll present them uh, as soon as to, uh, after we get them, you know, when we're confident of them. But um, the investigators, I think, um, are, we expect uh, um, um, the, the PI for that trial um, or the head of the protocol team is Susan Dorman and Jason Stout and I are the uh, co-chairs of the protocol team. And so I think we expect to be looking at that data sometime February or March. And, and uh, you know we'll let people know as soon as as, uh, as we can after that. Okay. Um, all right. And I think uh, let me see. Hold on. There's one one other question here that just came in. We'll take this last question. Uh, the question is is that um, they had a patient who was uh, post um, uh, cataract surgery and had LTBI and had uh, lens implants. Um, patients uh, ended up going on INH rather than uh, rifampin, but took it for six months and it had some untoward effects related to the uh, INH. Um, will the history of cataract implants affect use of the new um, uh, rifamycin, such as rifatentin? Well, I think um, the effect of, of that, you know, in terms of turning everything orange and stay, is the same as rifampin. So if it's the kind, um, it's my understanding, um, like for contact lenses, I think hard lenses get irreversibly stained and soft ones don't, but I always have to look this up, frankly, uh, every time. But it would be exactly the same as it was for a phantom. Right, and, and that's basically what I, what I tell folks as well, that with regard to rifampin, the way I just sort of think of it is just a longer acting rifampin, really not, not substantially different in that respect uh, yeah, exactly. with regard to toxicities and, and, and drug interactions very importantly, and that's gonna be a big issue 
uh, later on. And uh, one, uh, one last one that just came in um, is that uh, any new data on uh, XDR uh, TB? And I, I would say that probably these drugs are going to be having a role with XDR as well, but anything related to XDR that uh, you want to share? Um, not, not too much except that MDR and XDR TB to me are the like, most frightening things in the world. Um, you know, WHO, as I said, estimates there are about half a million people with MDR-TB, and right now, uh, again, according to WHO, no more than 50,000 of those patients are receiving treatment. Um, there are plenty of places in the world. I just came back from Kazakhstan, and that's a place with a lot of MDR-TB, where you, you essentially have palliative care programs for patients with TB. Um, wow. So, um, to me, the, the newest or most important thing about these things is the epidemiology. because their mechanisms of action are different from any of the other TB drugs that we have now, um, and so there's been no previous exposure. So um, that, that's a reason to have some hope. But in the meantime, I have to say MDR and XDR TB really frighten me because um, the vast majority of patients with those infections are not being treated right now. Yeah, I think as we have sort of lab scale up globally and have more cultures and susceptibilities being done, I think we're going to get a much truer picture, obviously, from uh, what's going on there. And I think that the increases that we end up seeing are not so much a new development per se, but just uh, maybe, um, you know, there's a, what is it Harry Truman said? It's that there's nothing new under the sun except the history you don't know. Uh, and that could so, very uh, well be true. Yeah, and I think that there might be a lot that's already out there that you know, might be increasing in incidence, but really it's what's increasing more than anything is our, our knowledge of it. Well, listen, I, I think that a lot of times when we talk about uh, TB, and, and particularly with MDR, XDR, that we many times point to the fact that people are getting palliative care for what was one time a completely curable disease and drug resistance wasn't a significant problem. We point 